Hey guys, I'm Tyler Hosley, just your normal Vans collecting Floridian. Mm. Oh, that's here. I thought you'd have something better than that. Like I, I was, I was really ready to be shocked and wowed. No, that was just that was just mediocre. I'm Dave Gray, and this week I learned uh, it doesn't matter how long they've been in. If you have to tell the doctor about the staples in your ass, it's always a fun time for you. Kevin Matthews, Scottish film fan living in England, and this week I learned after talking with a child last week on the podcast, it's a very different experience to try and entertain lots of children and make them think you're running a really successful chocolate factory when you have (laughs) an empty factory and some pipes. Isn't that every BBC set? (laughs) Yeah, but even they cover things up a bit a bit better than the the gold that we've been seeing on the news highlights of this ridiculous Willy Wonka thing. I thought that, I know Craig mentioned it earlier, I saw the poster advertising it, I thought that was fake, just because it was put together by AI and was so sloppy. Comedy gold. Oh, did it? What's the the unknown the new character, the new like, yeah. terrifying villainous character that comes out from behind a mirror and makes children cry. That was that was wonderful. I mean, he looks it's, like the body from Sinister. Yeah, yeah, he's he's quite menacing, despite being like very very cheap and crappy. They're trying to reopen it now because you know hipsters want to have uh, you know ironic days out at the, uh, the 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 terrible thing. Wow. Hmm. Uh, hi, I'm Craig, English film nerd, living in England once once again. Oh my yeah. god! Yeah. So I am I'm racist now, guys. So this is official. I've got the uh, information pack and all, all the paperwork. You made me fill that in, and I'm just just a very very racist fan now. This is really really a terrible week to have in the heat of the night, Kevin. When I'm, when I'm now a racist. Well, and don't forget, you yeah. also you're you're required to talk about how great the empire was yeah. once every yeah, I'm, hour. I, I I'm I'm not a fan. I mean, my daughter's mixed race, so I'm not even sure how much of her I should hate. It's a very confusing time for me. Between fifty but, and seventy five percent. Oh, okay, okay. I, I'm not sure what that looks like. We'll we'll we'll, we'll, we'll figure it out. Yeah. And uh, welcome to Raiders of the Podcast. Yay. I fucking remembered that all my own. Um, Yay, it only took six years. Yes. Uh, right. Uh, I watched this week. I watched The Zone of Interest, which I feel bad for having look, looked forward to it as much as I have, but I've been, been really pumped for it because I just love the director and, you know, the subject matter is, is fascinating. And yeah, it was just it was just as good as I expected to be. I think it's pretty incredible. It's uh, just. It is essentially like a, Kevin will get this. It's a like a feature length prequel to the BBC sitcom Keeping Up Appearances. Kind of. Um, no, but, and I'm not, I don't, don't think bring I was, my into this. I don't. It's just, that, that sounds really facetious, but like it's not a film about what you might expect. You might expect it to be a film about what the worst people on earth would do in a certain situation, and it, and it isn't. It's, it's about what your neighbours would do. It's about the people, what the people you see every day would probably do. It's about possessions and positions and status and all like all the trappings of a typical middle-class bourgeois existence. And it's just set against the backdrop of, you know, the, the organised slaughter of millions of human beings. It's, it's, it's just one of the greatest films about the banality of evil I've ever seen. It is crushing and so so good. And Sandra Huller is, she's astonishing. Again, she's she's two like runaway Oscar-winning performances this year. I, I I don't think I've seen anything before this. I know she's in. She's in the Sydney movie where her dad. Yeah, Tony Adams. 
that's one which I've been meaning to see, but I've I've not seen him in anything. And Wait, you haven't seen Anatomy of a Fall? Yeah, I've seen Anatomy of a Fall and Zone of Interest. Those are two things I've seen her in. And see one of those after the other. Yeah, she kind of she kind of blows your mind. She's a, an incredible actress. Um, Kevin, you've seen Zone of Interest. I don't I don't expect you to agree with the keeping up appearances. Law. <laughs> I do not. I know where you're coming from. Uh, and I do, right, I do generally agree with your sentiment. I, I had someone comment on my review that, you know, maybe it was kind of not necessary then and wouldn't reach the right people. And I'm like, it, it kind of is, because it is that reminder of the amount of people that could essentially keep looking the other way or just, you know, and do nothing. Well, yeah. horrible, horrible mass deaths into the millions were occurring very close by. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I'm not sure whether it's going to be your favourite film of the year. I know I feel sure it will be like in my top ten, but it's, it's almost certainly my favourite Glazer film. And I love all of the series. I think we've got lots of modern directors like uh, Chris Nolan and Villeneuve and... Um, uh, the guy who did Ex Machina, whose name I can't remember. They they all seem all seem to want to be um, Stanley Kubrick, but I think uh, I think Jonathan Glazer is probably the nearest we get at the moment to Stanley Kubrick. Lots of different genres, just that he's just just aced it. In. I I'm a, I'm a huge fan. Um, I've been getting a lot more anime in my life now. I'm in a very aggressively pro anime household at the moment so I'm getting introduced to all sorts of things uh, starting with uh, Berserk it's like a classic 90s anime show Berserk uh, yeah I love that it's just it's it's a supremely homoerotic fantasy series about it's about an orphan named Guts and his massive weapon and his relationship with this kind of ethereal god twink named uh, Griffith and yeah I I think it's Griffith god damn um, Steffi would kill me if I got that wrong but I think he's named Griffith and yeah I really like it I'm like I'm in I'm in pretty deep in like, the characters and the story it's really gripping me and I love the art style and the character design and I love the theme song and the theme song sounds like Japanese Windsor and it completely mismatches the, the tone and the setting of the show. It's got nothing to do with any of it. It's such a weird, odd mismatch, but I fucking love that song. I'm just humming it to myself all the time. So I, I really, really like uh, <laughs> whatever it's called, Berserk. Have you seen Berserk, Dave? I have. You should read the manga. The manga's still going, actually. The manga's been going since, like, 87. Yeah, I hear, like, the, the, the anime is really just, a, just a, like a fraction yeah, it's just it's a bigger story. Well, there's there's actually three series. There's three animes. I haven't seen the newest, but yeah, they're both just bits, and they're long. I think they're both twenty five episodes too. Yeah, yeah. All right, I will. Do. I will do. Uh, and finally, this week I squeezed in the first time watch of I know Dave's seen this one. Mothra. I haven't seen it before. Oh, yeah. And yeah, I had a blast with that. It's it's got such a good cast, man. Like, um, this guy called Ferenki Sakai, who is... There's a, there's a few look protagonists, but he's probably the main one. This really cheeky-faced, kind of chunky Japanese guy who is just... He's so immediately lovable. He's really great. And I love Jerry Ito as, as the villain. He's just the most spectacularly short-sighted villain who just carries on with his plots while they're causing the destruction of... Just about everything, and uh, and I love Mothra. I just I love Mothra. I admire his vibe. It's just his vibe is just travel in an uninterrupted straight line, destroying everything in my path until I get my shit back. And you know I I, I appreciate that. It was it was really really good fun. I don't think I loved it as much as I expected to, but it's just I love the visuals. I love the cast. I love the the effects. I love how weird that fucking story is because I was not expecting the, the the little people and you know what the entire plot of the film hangs on. It's so fucking strange. It's really good fun. 
So, uh, yeah, I really like that one. I assume Dave likes that one. Yeah. 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 I am also a fan. I saw it for the first time a few weeks ago. Fancy, fancy, fancy Blu ray? Uh, yes. Uh, uh, yes. Was it Eureka? Yeah, that's the one. Or Masters of Cinema. Yeah. 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 Yeah, and that's, uh, yeah, that's me for the week. Well, I mean, I kind of don't think I have any more to say on, on the zone of interest, really. So uh, I shall leave that. I also watched uh, Poor Things at last this week, which I really enjoyed. Um, if you like the stuff from Yorgos Lanthimos, you're going to enjoy this. It's a Frankensteinian steampunk tale of a woman discovering the sex and the restraints of polite society. Emma Stone's really good at it. I do think, though, that uh, I, I like Emma Stone. But I think she's very good generally. And I think she's good in this. I do think she's probably... Um, you know, she wouldn't be my favourite or top pick for the for the Oscar. Like I would put both Lily Gladstone and Sandra Fuller above her for that. Uh, Mark Ruffalo is a lot of fun in his supporting time, though. Um, I'd like to see him get a nod for this, but I, I don't know if the fact that it is quite comedic will work against him. I can't remember if he's been picking up many or if it's all been Robert Downey Jr. Uh, I think so far. I think it's mostly been junior. Mm. It'd be like for me, it would be a pleasant surprise if Ruffalo uh, bagged it, to see, because of it being quite comedic and crude and funny. Did you guys see poor things yet? No, but okay. I've read the book. Yes, Red Zone of Interest book, too. Book set in Glasgow, isn't it? Yeah, I think so. Zone of Interest. No, poor things. <laughs> I I watched poor things this week as well. Um, I agree with Kevin. I loved it. It's probably my favorite Yorgos film now. I think it's great. I thought Emma Stone was great. Mark Ruffalo was great. Um, it's pretty filthy for a uh, a mainstream movie with Emma Stone, which I thought was awesome. Yeah, it, it's really good. I loved it. Yeah, yeah, but they gave it yeah. a happy ending, and the book shouldn't have a happy ending. Kind of defeats the point. To me, so I, 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 it's like zone of interest. I just hated the book so much. I can't folks tell me the movie's great, but like I hated those books so much. And this is why I continue to avoid reading books that you mentioned, Dave. So it's <laughs> only making a road for your own back. Yeah. <laughs> it's, um, mm-hmm. I, yeah, it's it's just it is good though. My my favorite from Lanthimos is still the Lobster. And this, in a way, this makes kind of a nice companion piece to this because, uh, you know, if that was sort of about love, this is sort of about sex. Uh, it's it's a good thing, and a very so different, a very yeah, yeah dog is is we know, but very different from all of those is upgraded, which was on Amazon Prime and is a cheesy slick rom com, another one. I think that's about two and two weeks that I watched. Uh, it's fun. It's predictable. As uh, Camila Mendez in the in the main role, and the guy she ends up having a meet cute with is played by Archie Renault. I saw someone describe this as kind of a rom com mixed with The Devil Wears Prada, because Marisa to me is the really demanding and unrelenting high maintenance boss. Uh, I think that's quite an apt description, but it's it's good for this kind of thing. It's a perfectly Kevin Seven kind of film. And then uh, last but not least, I watched uh, The Three Treasures in my ongoing kaiju filmography quest. You know what The Three Treasures doesn't have much of? You'll know it's David. Yes. 
It doesn't have much kaiju action, does it? No. It's a historical drama. Yes. It's set, essentially telling a creation myth about the gods in Japan you, and Shintoism. You do know the Three Treasures is the the Taoist uh, creationist myth. I mean, I didn't know that, Dave. I've, uh, I, I saw a poster with oh, a, a, snake, a snake monster with lots of heads on it. I thought, that's the next one in my kaiju journey. This is going to be a blast. Nope. Three hours later, I thought, was that worth it for five minutes of the sneaky monster that looked like it had escaped from a Harry Housen movie? Maybe it was. I, I'm just sorry you didn't see the 112 minute version. At least that's shorter. Yeah, I, I saw different versions, and you know me, I was like, well, if I'm going to watch it, I'll try and watch the complete version. And it's, it's maybe not the best way to watch it either, but it was on the Internet Archive in the full version. So I was like, I'll do that. There is stuff to enjoy in this. I mean, the the lead is uh, Toshiro Mifune, so I think we generally all love him. So that was a plus. But, yeah, it's not, like, in terms of your historical melodramas, it's not great. So I, I enjoyed bits of it. But uh, the highlight for me was the the creature who may appear in another movie that is actually more just kaiju fun. I can't recall because it, it does look like a hydra. It's an eight headed snake called Yamata no Orichi. And I'm sure checking on that monster somewhere, I so saw it was in something else that was a monster mash. So hmm. it's well, it's marked off the list. Well, there was. Um... Orichi did get his own movie in the 90s, I think. Oh, interesting. Yeah, uh, I, I don't know if that's the one from that. Because the interesting thing about Three Treasures is it's Japan trying to do a Cecil B. DeMille style epic. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, like as a curiosity, I think it's interesting. But yeah, it is. It is a test. <laughs> It, it, it is a test, but again, it's interesting. It has that kind of um, you know, certain certain bits that are sort of the, the tales within the tale, which is, you know, it just all could have been a bit better, though. It's bizarre because the writers and the director, like they've got you know, like, like a lot of uh, people whose filmographies I've looked at in this uh, quest already. They've got a hell of a lot on their filmographies. And uh, and some of them explore similar ground, but yeah, it wasn't a winner for me. It's probably the weakest one I've watched so far. Um, and I did then try and sort of just you know judge it from what it is, though, rather than what I hoped it would be. But I think even by those standards, it was it was a bit disappointing. So it was right down the middle, just a five out of ten film for me. But uh, that was it. I uh, I didn't. Watch too much. I, I had other things going on, so uh, <laughs> I was worried about you a minute ago. Yeah, <laughs> you came and asked you questions. You were like, "Yeah, yeah." Sorry, no. I, I, I wonder whether they were opening up or something. No, no, just <laughs> distracted. There's screaming outside. That I don't think you guys can uh, hear. So, uh, I yeah, I, I didn't have uh, a lot of viewing time. Uh, I did watch. In Love and Deep Water on Netflix, which is a Japanese comedy mystery romance film set on a giant cruise ship. It is, well, it's a Japanese rom-com mystery set on a cruise ship. The cast is fine, the jokes are broad and cheesy, and the mystery is underbaked. It is a solid Kevin 5. Um, it might even be a Kevin 7 if Kevin were to rate it himself, but I'd give it a 5. It's not the worst thing you can watch, and it's cute enough if that's what you're in the mood for, and that is what I was in the mood for. So, yay me. I also watched, also on Netflix, the Thai show Ready, Set, Love, which uh, I really enjoyed in a dystopian future where there's only, you know, very few men left. Five bachelors are given away on a game show called Ready, Set, Love. And there's more things going on than meets the eye. And it's it's goofy fun. Uh, it kind of dabbles in some darker th- 
things, but it never really lets go of the quirky tone, and I, I had a blast with it. And that's that's pretty much it for me. I, you know, besides that, I like I haven't been watching any TV except some animes on, on Crunchyroll, which I gave up my subscription of. It that ended yesterday, so you know I can't I can't even catch up on solo leveling anymore. Well, I was gonna have a nice double feature of deep anal drilling and uh, Perv City University anal majors, but I sadly did not have time. Sorry, but I did watch Poor Things, which was great, and I followed Kevin's recommendation of Megalomaniac, which I loved. Yeah, you like, did. I did. It, it felt like such a throwback to late not late two thousands French New Wave era of horror, like Frontiers and Martyrs and Shitan. It's super nasty. It's super mean spirited. Just it totally took me back to the days of the good old days of horror. When people didn't give a shit about violence and they could just be as sadistic as it possibly could. It's yeah, it's a nasty, nasty little serial killer movie. And I, I loved it. So yeah, thanks for the break, Kevin. That was right up my alley. Very good stuff. And um yeah, like I said, that was me. I bailed on that twice. I got about ten minutes in the first time and I think about twenty five minutes the second time. Should I do I keep going? Yes. I, I started it last night and I, I fell asleep. <laughs> it wasn't the movie, it was me. Yeah. I, I, I feel like going back a third time makes me a gun for punishment, but I'll go, I'll go back a third time. On the recommendation from Tyler. And Kevin. Jesus. And Kevin. Yeah, both of us. Uh, I, I think... I, I do think once it sort of gets a bit more into it, I knew it was going to appeal to Tyler anyway, but I think as it gets more into it and you see what it what it's exploring more of, I think it, it sort of brings you in more. All right, okay. I'll go back in. But no guarantees. <laughs> no, no, you give, you give me the guarantee. You give me the cast iron guarantee now. <laughs> it is what it is. This week, we watched the 1946, sorry, 1946 British thriller film Green for Danger and the 1967 American neo-noir mystery drama In the Heat of the Night. Craig, would you like to pick a movie yes. and tell us about it? Uh, all right, I'll go with Green for Danger. Um... First thing, I like. I know I sound like an idiot here, like an actual profound idiot. I had never really considered that film production like carried on like right through World War Two, like we kept making films. And I should have realised there's, there's not like a seven-year empty period with no films. The forties were like really active, really productive time. But it just just never occurred to me until I watched this film that films were produced. During the Blitz. I just found that really strange. That I hadn't considered it, and but it happened. Um, yeah, I liked being to danger quite a bit. It, it felt uneven. I, I definitely felt it was uneven. Like, I really, really dug the first half of it. And the second half, not so much. Um, I like the cast, like, uh, Sadie Gray, Meg Jenkins, Henry Edwards, they all, they all have to walk that kind of charming but suspicious line and they do it really well. I think my only issue with any of them was uh, with Henry Edwards because I just couldn't buy him as like the resident panty dropper at the hospital when when Trevor Howard is right there. I mean, I love Trevor Howard. And he's great in this, great as he, yeah, he always is. Uh, I really like Judy Campbell as well. She's a scene stater. She gives that. She gives really good, um, kind of love lawn to the point of being a bit crazy vibes. She pulls us off like really well. Again, I don't really get it because like, Trevor Howard is right there. I don't, I don't get the appeal of Henry, Henry Edwards. And you know, old Trevor's there, newly single. He just, just pops on that. That's fine. Um, 
really beautifully shot. Well, the first half, really beautifully shot. It's that second, the second murder sequence. That's really, really nicely put together. It's like a full on gothic horror movie with kind of Hitchcock stylings. It's really, really striking. Uh, I like the mystery. The mystery was, you know, it kept me intrigued for most of it. I thought the score was really effective. Apart from, you know, the extremely, like, silly, oopsie-daisy comedy blunder music that they have when they introduce out of their sin. That was, that was embarrassing. But, you know, up until, actually, you know what, when As the Sim is climbing over that fence and falls over the music, it's sort of, it's sort of heralded the downturn in this film for me and it's nothing to do with Sim himself because he's he's wonderful like he that character is a real piece of shit and it's it's like never clear how much of that is a tactic and how much of it is just him being a legit asshole. he's just a real real just a really unpleasant person I really enjoyed him he played that really well I mean I would probably confess just to, like, correct him. Like, if he said something wrong, I'd be like, ha, fuck you, actually, I did it like this. So maybe it's more of a tactic than him just being a piece of shit, but... Yeah, he was a great character. It just felt like he was there to paper, paper over a few tracks in the second half, because I felt like I started to lose interest when the production itself kind of lost interest, like... The performances, the cinematography, just like the whole energy of the story just seemed to get a little stayed. Like I feel like it had a lot of fun setting all of this stuff up and then had like very little fun unspooling it all for the audience. Days. It, all, it kind of feels a little functional in the back end. It's like, okay, we've had fun setting all this up. Now let's, you know, to go through the motions. I don't know. I don't the reveal didn't do a lot for me, but like I thought the method was kind of interesting when the motive was underwhelming and it just I don't know, I was I, I guess I guess I was just losing interest towards the end. I mean I think there were probably elements of it that didn't fully really translate because just like the increased paranoia of the time was probably that probably added to it a great deal, but it was for me, it was a film of two halves. Like, one of them was, like, full of promise and really, really stylish. And then the, just the back end didn't quite deliver on all that was promised in the first half. So it just, you know, I'm not sad I watched it. It's worth a one-time watch, I think, but I don't think I'll ever go back to it. it was, it's... Ah, it's it, it's, it's okay. I had a good time with it overall, but I, 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 I just... I just found it a little underwhelming and a little unsatisfying. Do you want to go to you or do you want me to go? Um, you can go. All right. Yeah. Um, I I tend to agree with with Craig here. I um like I didn't mind this. It was okay. It was certainly a lot better when Alison appeared, which I I think it's about ten or fifteen minutes in, but it felt so much longer because at the start I just wasn't really interested. You get the uh, you get the framing device and the voiceover, but I didn't really care, and I never cared for any of these. Characters, um, apart apart from Sim's character, and he was uh, quite, yeah, you know, he was equal parts uh, smart and silly within the same scenes quite often. Um, by the time you get to the film, did his presence make that much of a difference? It's, uh, I think, it's something that could be argued. I think the uh, tensions between the hospital staff members were just, you know, they, they didn't, just didn't do anything for me. And, yeah, when everything was revealed at the end, I, I still didn't care. And I thought the, I thought the end was really 
drawn out and silly. Like the actual tense climax of having a run there. Some of the reveals are great, including the uh, so where the title comes from. Really liked that being sort of explained and pieced together. But once accusations are made and people start to react, it just becomes a bit ridiculous. Especially when a crowd of people end up at a doorway looking through at two other people that they're then trying to get to. It just just felt like they, they didn't seem to be trying as hard as they could to get through and then reach those other people. I didn't think. Um, but like Sim is is really good in his role. I think he's great. Is <laughs> that maybe goes without saying that he's he's pretty much always great in films. So there is that. But he seems to enjoy playing the character. He he has fun with it, and the script has him as a very flawed. Uh, I've got to put hero in quotation marks. But yeah, Dave will eventually tell us all about how good the novel is and how we're all heathens for not having read this series of 50 novels about this character. There are not 50 and novels about we, this character. We would appreciate this more. How many novels are? Because I know are, you know. Um, seven. Seven. Have you read them? Uh, yes. Yes. Um, I, I, but I don't. No I, one has I, read seven books. That's absolute <laughs> bullshit. I'm not having that. Ridiculous. Um, what what gets me is like, and maybe you can't explain this, Dave. Maybe I'm just being too thick. But what is the other, like, what would be the main defining character of Sims character, Cockrell? Well, Cockrell is uh, actually it's it's something that doesn't carry over, probably his height, but um, Cockrell is usually uh, a bit acerbic, which I think Sims generally does a good job of in this. There's there are they do playing for pratfalls too often since they can't do the short jokes that the books do. Okay, but as it compared to compared to others who at the, at the time might just be more standard. Uh, polite and patient inspectors and detectives. Well, in the in the book, uh, he has a real humanitarianism to him, which I think Sim pulls off, but might not totally come off for everyone. Hmm. Yeah, I, I didn't, I didn't get more from him, although I was enjoying Sim's performance, and and I liked that. But for just for a character in seven books, I, I would wonder what the main draw is for that, you know, to come up with some, something a bit more unique, whereas it felt unique to me because of Sim's performance. But there are obviously qualities that were maybe translated from the page to the screen well anyway. But I, I enjoyed this. It's um, it's a decent little diversion, but it feels very throwaway. And as I say, it, I enjoyed it despite never really being invested in any of the other supporting characters and never really caring about the uh, the ultimate resolution of the mystery, which I think is you know a bit of a, a mark against something like this because that would be that would be the main thrust of it. That's me. You know, I'm just really disappointed that nobody asked me if I read all seven novels because I did. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, um, to be totally honest, I couldn't really get into this one, guys. I, I just didn't really find any of it very engaging as a whole, especially the first act. I'm on like the exo- exact opposite end of Craig here. I didn't really care for this first act at all, which is pretty much just a soap opera with nurses and doctors bickering at each other. Um, even though I did really like that. British makeshift hospital World War II setting. I thought that was really cool. Um, everything else just felt super dull to me. Not to say it was bad. I just 
personally wasn't really vibing with it. it it's a mostly routine little mystery. It's decently executed with, with an okay cast. I really liked Alistair Sim in this, though. I'm not overly familiar with him as an actor, but I liked him as the inspector here and his like super dry wit. He's really good. Um, I would say he's like by far the best thing about this entire movie, in my opinion. Just unfortunately, it just wasn't enough to save it for me because I just I really didn't like the ending at all. Um, like Kevin, I didn't really care about the mystery being resolved. It just, it, everything just felt super anticlimactic and goofy. I just there's good things here, but I was mostly pretty bored uh, for the most part. So it's not terrible. I just just wasn't feeling it. I am a big fan of Green for Danger. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought I assumed you were done with that. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah Okay, awesome. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm a big fan of Green for Danger. I think Sim is nearly perfect as Inspector Cockerel. I guess his humanitarianism doesn't quite come off as well in this viewing as it does generally. The seven books by Christiana uh, Brand are some of the best and least uh, attention given English mysteries. Uh, instead of being up there among the best known, I think this is the only adaptation. Well, not the only ad. It's the only straight adaptation. Uh, a few of these books have been plundered for other series, like um, uh, what's what's the one about the vicar? This ran forever. Oh, was it Father Dowling? No, Brown? well, Dowling was the Catholic priest played by uh, the dad from Happy Days. But yeah, Father Brown. That they rated two of the books, I think. A few others of the long running uh, English series have rated the others. Uh you know, it's it's a it's a shame because uh Cockrell's a solid character who doesn't get respect. Where like Philo Vance has seven films and Philo Vance might be the worst fictional detective of all time. And they removed his one unique trait in the movies. So that's fun. Well, it makes sense though, because it was the forties, but whatever. Um, it's, it's a solid little mystery. I can see why it wouldn't work for people. Like, I, I understand why the first act might drag for some people. It meticulously sets up the characters. It, it meticulously sets up a why. Uh, but it's a well-constructed mystery. It's a better constructed mystery than most out there. There's no questions left hanging. A leads to B leads to C and none of, there's no aha twist. The ending's a little... I, I can see why the ending would fall flat, although the last scene in the OR is pretty solid until the very... they get through those doors. I, I, can, I can see why that wouldn't work, because it, it does feel a bit rushed. But uh, I, I still think it's one of the best English mysteries, especially how many you know mysteries came out of England in 1946. And they worked in the Blitz it, it's a pretty good effect most of the time. It's, it's a solid mystery that I think just doesn't get attention. So that's why uh, I've been meaning to pick it for a while and I finally did. I am glad to have done it. It won't win. I knew it wasn't going to win the second Kevin said in the heat of the night. But <laughs> it's a solid little hey, mystery that can hold its own. Don't forget how righteous I am now. Don't forget how yeah, you but- yeah, yeah, but one it still does not equal a win. Well, the racist vote. Well, <laughs> yay! I, both me and, and Inspector Cockrell are so happy to have the racist vote. <laughs> I mean, I'm not getting a sweep because Craig has spent this week raging port scratchings <laughs> while he was trying to get through in the heat of the night. So, laughing at Ricky Gervais jokes. <laughs> You oh. bastard. <laughs> Sitting outside, shaking your fist at any way that's not quite English <laughs> enough looking. I know how it is. T better start on the next movie or I will just make jokes about Craig's racism. <laughs> so in the heat of the night, uh, tells the story of Virgil Tibbs, an African-American police detective from Philadelphia who becomes embroiled in a murder investigation in a small town in Mississippi. Uh, this movie is fantastic. 
I actually saw this for the first time back in high school. My ninth grade history teacher used to show us like classic movies every Friday. And this was one of those many movies the class watched. Uh, it's one of those like deep South films where you can feel like every single drop of heat pouring from that Mississippi sun. I love the atmosphere here. Um, Sydney Portier is absolutely brilliant in this movie. Uh, dude was always a powerhouse, but he's just so fucking good in this. Um, the rest of the cast is really good as well, even though Portier is the only likable presence in this movie. Um, racism is always a super touchy subject to tackle in any decade of film, but it was really touchy for it for a story like this in 1967, and I think it's all handled really well. Jewison directs the shit out of this movie. I, he's also a really great filmmaker, so that's not surprising. I'm, I'm hoping we get to the original Rollerball one day on here. I just love that movie. I think he's a great filmmaker, and The Hurricane's really good. He's, he's made a lot of good shit. Um, it's always gripping. It moves quick. It never feels dated. I mean, yes, it's a movie made in 1967, so it definitely won't feel modern comparing it to films made now. But I just I can't believe how well this truly holds up. It's a, it's a detective film. It's a murder mystery. Just and a look at like systematic racism in the '60s with an absolutely fantastic central performance from Sidney Poitier. Just it's excellent stuff. I, did, I you know it's funny. I I had no idea this was a TV series, and now I kind of want to watch it after watching this. So yeah, this was excellent. When you say that, it, it actually, this could have been this could have been. Um could have been based yesterday. But the oh, yeah. story of this, the, the plot, the characters, everything, it could, it could all have been set yesterday and it wouldn't wouldn't be a big shock. Easily. So, um, yeah, In the Heat of the Night's a classic. It's, it's an absolutely fantastic film. That adapts an absolutely fantastic novel. There were um, seven Virgil Tibbs novels, also. I, I think Mr. Tibbs had uh, like five or six short stories, also. I, I don't know if they've been collected. I've never read them. They ran in. Uh, I think you haven't read Queen. them. No, I have. I've read the books, not the short stories, because I think they only ran in Ellery Queen magazine, and uh, you know I. I have not run across all that many of them over the years in the wild. I've got a few, though. I do have a, a shelf dedicated to Ellery Queen magazine. Racist. I, I know. The score is by Quincy Jones and is fantastic. The title song uh, is Ray Charles, which is brilliant. It is, it is, it's a great movie. Sidney Poitier is absolutely fantastic. Is Virgil Tibbs. Uh, not only was the man gorgeous, he was just incredibly terrifyingly talented. Uh, also Rod Steiger, or, yeah, Rod Steiger as, as Gillespie, Gillespie, whatever, is Gillespie. Gillespie, Mm -hmm. thank you, yes. I, I'm, I, like, I wrote it down, I'm staring at it, I'm like, God, I can't fucking read anything right now. Uh, he's fantastic. The scene of them in Gillespie's home is yeah. absolutely like that is two masters just delivering career making scene. I mean, it is it is an amazing scene between these two guys. It's it's wonderful. Um, the. I mean, it's called In the Heat of the Night, and that's the name of the book, but, like, the heat is, like, physically oppressive. There is no scene without people just sweating buckets. Like, it, it's everywhere. It's soaked in every still, in every, every frame. It's it's gorgeous. It's a solid mystery, of course. Um, and, you know, the two sequels are really good, too, when we eventually get around to them. Uh, you know... Um, I love all the old Coke machines around. I fucking love those. With the, the old glass door. That's just me, personally. So, uh, Mr. Tibbs, this is just a fun fact, is paid $162.39 a week in 1967 to solve homicides. That equals uh, $1,510.89 today. 
I, I don't know if that's in line with the homicide detectives paying per week. But there you go. Mm. Um, yeah, it's good. And it's, it's a nice look at... I mean, okay. It might be a little too kind to the ur- urbane African-American city cop. But it's, you know, about racism. So, but it's, it's a really solid and unflinching look at issues in the system, especially in certain places. And yeah, it's, it's great. It, it's a classic for a reason. Uh, unlike T, I have seen the TV series and it's not nearly as good as just, you know. I mean, it, they actually do keep the, the racist theme and, and the change in the character. So it's, it's not terrible, but it is of its time. If you know what I mean? Yeah. But it's definitely an interesting turn for Carol O'Connor to make after being Archie Bunker. Especially because he was, like, really into being hands-on to driving home the anti-racism themes. He almost quit after the first season because of it. Because they didn't go hard enough for him, and he didn't get the creative control he wanted. So, you know, that's an interesting little aside, but... Yeah, you should see in the heat of the night. It's it's a fucking classic for a reason. Uh, yeah, I've seen this uh, once before in Tyler's ninth grade class. I was held back for about five or six years. <laughs> um, no, I did not go to home. Uh, I the way I I thought it was just a great fucking movie with a couple of really minor flaws and. This time around, I felt I felt exactly the same. Like it didn't shrink or grow in my estimation. It just it's so such a fucking solid movie in a way where you're gonna get that same movie each time you watch it. If that makes sense, you're just always gonna get this supremely solid fucking movie. Like the filmmaking is is so strong. Like the score and the cinematography, they're they're really evocative. Um, it's beautifully lit throughout. Um, the production design, costuming in particular, is is perfect. Um, and I love it's so atmospheric. And yet, all of that almost seems like a nice bonus because this film is just about it's about the writing and the performances. Like I feel like you could do this, you could do this on an empty fucking stage. This story with those actors, and you'd lose like a. A surprisingly minor amount of you know what makes a movie sing, what makes it really, really work. Like the writing is fucking exemplary. Like Virgil Tibbs is such a smartly written, rounded character. It must have been so tempting, given the thing, the ideas I wanted to put across. It would have been really tempting to write him as this flawless human being, but you know, for all his virtues, he. He's not perfect. He lets his own understandable prejudice prejudices, you know, they take him off track more than once. I, I haven't seen the other Tibbs films, but I feel like the character is really fascinating. I feel like he'd be a quite an interesting study in in black exceptionalism, not just the character, you know, on screen, but also the the impetus behind creating him off screen. If that makes any sense at all. I think there's there's probably a lot of a lot of interesting stuff to learn about learn about that character and through that character. I just I really liked him. Um, and it would have been really easy to write, you know, Steiger or Oates' characters as just, you know, one note scumbags or, you know, those guys who, you know, have a come to Jesus moment in the third act and just renounce racism. But you know, they they kind of close out the film pretty you know, pretty thoroughly humanized, you know, still with ninety nine percent of their prejudices still intact probably, but you know, you 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 understand them better and they are humanized. And I think it's it's a much more complicated film than it needed to be, because it's kind of breaking taboos with what with with what you get just in a basic synopsis. Like this on the most basic level is quite taboo breaking for the time. So to go as deep into the subject and be be as complex as it is is really something and of, and the cast you know they, they just play it beautifully like i love scott wilson i love baby scott wilson I love oh Ancient i mean scott wilson i meant to say that i think this is the youngest i've ever seen scott wilson oh absolutely 
like seeing baby face Scott Wilson is, is crazy, but no, I love him. He was great here. Uh, Warren Oates, as far as I can say, Warren Oates is one of the greatest character actors of all time. And he's just, you know, brilliant here. Steiger is, yeah, he's kind of a heartbreak. In this. He's like that, the painful loneliness. He's so, he's just riddled of his insecurities and his, you know, perceived inadequacies. And, they're all just hidden below like layers of empty bullshit posturing and Steiger really really plays a human the human element of that character so well and and Plottier is just fucking unbelievable. Like I mean he is fucking steely, like his eyes, man, his eyes are incredible. All that all that controlled rage behind the eyes is just fantastic. But what really what stands out stands out for me is I think you first see it during his inspection of a body, like his voice while he's listing the instruments he requires and the, the way he handles the body. There's so much there, like the, the calmness, the tenderness, the sense of duty. It's just fucking beautiful. This is it's a beautiful, beautiful performance with so many layers to it. I just fucking love Potty. And it's like the writing and the performances are just fucking beautiful. Like, my minor issues with the film, they're really, they're really minor. The attempted, like, beating or lynching at the rail yard is it's a tense scene, but it gets a little bit, like, West Side Story in its staging at points. You know, I guess that's, you know, the time it was made. Uh, the scene with the Purdy siblings at the station, there, there's some really bad acting in there, and it kind of kind of stinks up the place for a little bit. And the climax... It, it doesn't 100% land with me because I, I know they wanted a climax that didn't lean too much into either Tibbs or Gillespie's prejudices, but by doing so, I just don't think it was 100% satisfying. But, yeah, there are really, really, really minor issues in a film that's like, it's kind of a, a miraculous fucking banger. And it, especially given the year it came from, I don't think many... Films from the 1960s. And there, there are loads of wonderful films in the 1960s, don't get me wrong, but there are not many that stand up today quite like In the Heat of the Night does. It's, uh, yeah, it's, like, like everyone said, it's a classic for a reason. It's beautiful. Loved it. I mean, I don't think I have anything to add. This is one of those films that has been on my shelf. For a ridiculous amount of time, I've obviously known of it over the years. Uh, Norman Jewison died was it a few weeks ago, I think. Yeah. Or a month ago. Uh, and everyone was celebrating his work. And just, you know, there were reminders everywhere that he did in the heat of the night. And the heat of the night is brilliant. Sidney Poitier is brilliant in it. Rod Steiger is brilliant. So I was like, yes, I really need to to get this watched and um, yeah like th- there's a reason why it's talked up and praised so much it's it's great um, uh, it's it's strange that I haven't actually seen that many films with uh, Sidney Poitier I've seen this years ago I saw the I think is it him and the Defiant Ones with Richard Curtis yep. uh, Tony Curtis uh, so I've seen that and I've seen like stuff he directed Star Crazy I'm a big fan of uh, he, I can't recall other titles he's directed but that's that's it not enough and then you know you get you get him in this for a few minutes and he's a star you can you can see why he had the roles that he had he uh just holds the screen, has a commanding presence, and his character here needs to <clears throat> walk that fine line that uh, that he does so well. But Plotty gets to play him with with the right mix of uh, cool, intelligence, uh, deference when he knows he needs to be. Um, patient and wait until he's not in an immediately dangerous situation and it, it's just all fantastic 
Um, the interesting thing about Steiger's character is Steiger, rather than be, I mean, he is <laughs> a racist, and uh, you know, it's it's bad throughout for how um, Virgil Tibbs is treated. But Steiger's character, as is highlighted throughout the film, isn't sort of directly in line with the the many racists that would have been there before him. Someone says the previous uh, you know, sheriff or whatever would have shot Tibbs and said it was self-defense when when Platy's character does something that's uh, you know, that angers someone else. And when Steiger is talking to, to Platy, he knows that he, he already susses quite early that he's smart and trying to stay one step ahead. And that's not just because he finds out he's a police detective, not necessarily because the, you know, Platy's boss says he's more of the best at his job. It's, it's almost as if Steiger's picked this up already from seeing how he's handled the situation, from knowing that, that Tibbs could have been in a lot more trouble police detective or not and he was just uh, you know, he knew the best way through every interaction that he was dealing with initially, but he would uh, you know, be their best chance at, at solving his case and as someone says to the, the local uh, cops you off if the case doesn't get solved they can you know, just blame this guy so that's a, that's a, a good way to, to have everybody with the the right uh, for the story motivation for that. I just I, th- I think it's great. I agree with, agree with Craig that, uh, that you know I'm not entirely sure about how the finale locks together uh, solidly, but it's really good. Uh, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed the reveal. I enjoyed the uh, the the solving of things. It was a good journey with Platy also tripping up on a couple of occasions with his own. The prejudices that he's projecting, but um, yeah, I I can't find as much fault with this, so I I didn't even mind that confrontation moment that maybe does have a hint of West Side Story about it, but it was really good because you did feel that uh, that Pwati was in real danger there. It's it's a reminder that he's in the middle of nowhere in a small town full of people that will happily, happily beat or kill him and leave him at the side of the road. Um, it, it also looks really just, just really crisp and lovely for it. Like, I I watched this, you guys are right about obviously feeling the heat for every scene, but I was also surprised at how kind of fresh and not dated the visual style is I know it's 67 it's not exactly like you know something that's been polished after being found from 1931 but uh, watching this this was really just it felt more modern and just yeah just like a, a piece of the puzzle that goes into you know, standard like here and now cinema. Uh, there was there was nothing to me that that really dated it, apart from the actual you know setting the time and place. But as Craig said, this could also happen yesterday or today in certain places. Anyway, uh, I I wanted this to be as good as people had said it was over the years, and it is, if not better. Uh, just fantastic. I'm glad I finally marked off the checklist. And uh, I'm assuming the sequels though, aren't as good. But it'd still be fun to watch uh, Poite reprise that character. Would that be right, Dave? They're, they're not going to be as good, are they? Well, no, they're, they're not. And they're original stories that don't stay with the books like this one does. Hmm. I was so. going to say that I, I like that this stayed so close to the books and and all the books that were were done with it. It really 
worked with the books, and the books were great, but the film of the books. I'm just. I was just really well. saying, there's seven novels that could have stayed closer. That's all I meant. Yeah. No, I I agree. Uh, for if if I'd read the books, I I really uh, was happy with this. It was just a, a real satisfying watch, and yeah, I'm, I'm glad to have finally done I'm, another film that I wish I'd you know put into my viewing schedule years ago. Fun fact, In the Heat of the Night was 59th on uh, director Akira Kurosawa's top 100 films list. It was above both MASH and uh, Godfather 2. But below Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf and uh, Bonnie and Clyde. It's that time. It's time to pick one and as much as I enjoy Green for Danger, and I think everybody should go see it because it's a solid mystery from a time that, uh, you know, doesn't get a lot of... Well, I mean, the 40s get a lot of love for their mysteries because of the noirs. But, you know, uh, made... It, you know, it's a good one. But no, In the Heat of the Night's the better film. Just objectively, it's the better movie. Fucking Kevin. <laughs> yeah, in the heat of the Yep, in the heat of the night. Uh, yeah, in the in the heat of the night. So weep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We know. Ah, uh, isn't that great? Good for you. Like you didn't fucking stack that back. Ooh. You okay, dog? <laughs> my step stool just fell over on my my dog. I hope he's okay. Anyway, yeah, because you didn't stack that fucking deck. I've stacked mine for next week by just not not picking something more for one. Yay! <laughs> so, all right, T, come on, rise to the challenge. What, what what are you bringing for us next week? Well, I am uh, once again just staying in that comfort zone of the procedural serial killer thriller genre, and we're going to watch To Catch a Killer from 2023. Okay. Um... I have a bit of a journey. I was like, well, Kevin's not going to be. I didn't think Kevin was going to be in actually. And I think once you ask me, like, if you're going to go rogue again and do a TV show, let me know so I don't have to do it. So I did have a rogue option lined up. And I thought what would be more fun was if we watched one of Kevin's favorite movies without him. But then, and I'm glad I did this because it says that you are going to be in it. So I thought you make, you're making this way too much about Kevin. Like, he's in your head. Just forget about Kevin. Pick a film, pick a film off your shelf. And I just got a really fancy 4K Blu-ray from Vidigar Syndrome that, of a movie I've always I've always fancied. So we're going to watch uh, Saul of Bass's uh, one and only feature as director, the 1974 sci-fi horror Phase 4. Nice. Ooh. Yay, look at, look at that. Keeping it classy. Well, one of you, sort of. <laughs> uh, as always, uh, who's picking first for the um, graphic gay sex special oh. we decided on earlier? Is that the one we decided on? That was oh, yeah, yeah, we I thought we were Richard that. Donner. Yeah, I thought we were doing Richard uh, Donner oh, also. Yeah, we do, we do. Oh yeah, one stage, one stage. <laughs> I, I don't know. T, you got a Richard Donner pick? I do, actually. Um. Yeah, I'm going to go with uh, Lethal Weapon 4. That's the kind of pick that keeps going because uh, Kevin's going to have to watch 1, 2, and 3 just, <laughs> just because no, he does. No, 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 no. I'm well familiar with Lethal Weapons 1, 2, and 3, so thank you. Oh. I will skip straight to 4. A ta-da. I think he's full of shit and he's going to watch at least one. For the Busey. There's well, Busey and two. I always forget. It's always time for Mr. Joshua. Uh, yeah. Oh, one. Yeah, part I, four I thought it was one. Yeah, part two, four is, is, right. two is uh, diplomatic immunity. Oh. And it. Right. Okay. Right. I always I always forget which, <laughs> which numbered sequel is which numbered sequel. Yeah. Hey, how come, how come we thought weapons ever talked about in the Christmas movie discussion? Because... I think it's, I don't know. it's maybe better than Die Hard. 
like it's a shame, oh, it's a shame no, last no, year, right? No, I really like it. I mean, I'm just I'm just saying, Die, Die Hard's great, but I think it's it's fame. because like it's there and it is it is a constant because it's around that time, but it's not as like it is not as integrated. What the fuck are you talking about? They have an action scene at a Christmas tree lot. Yeah, I know, but that's, it ends it's, up it's, it's, with Mr. Joshua being beaten to death as Santa Claus lands on the fucking home. <laughs> I mean, one Santa does not a Christmas movie make this. You know that? <laughs> Otherwise, you just throw Tim Allen in a hundred other movies. Oh. <laughs> is that what you want? Is that no, what you, you know you that is not. You no, know that is oh. not what I want. You know that. I don't think that's funny. Thank you very much. Was Lethal Weapon... Did that introduce uh, Mel as some sort of, like, tortured messiah? No, that would be, uh... That would be Mad Max. Maybe even Gallipoli. Yes, straight away. Yeah, he did not... We could have no... a couple of scenes where, uh, where they had to my nipples. No. Yeah. I mean, we... Lethal Weapon here in the in the UK it was one of the first ones where, like, you were excited for it to come on TV and then realised it was shredded. The final fight mm. when I recorded it off TV when I was young lasted about like five seconds, and uh, I think that famously had the um, the equivalent of like Melon Farmer in there for <laughs> a swear word. Wow. Oh, it, it was it was awful to to watch. But I think that's when I first started to think, hmm, maybe the TV channels aren't showing the films in the way they were meant to be represented. <laughs> I bet there were a few melon farmers out there who were like, this is just it's going too far. <laughs> <laughs> I think they just appreciated the representation. Oh yeah, probably. We're on the gram, Raiders underscore of underscore the underscore podcast. We're on Facebook, where I sometimes remember to post stuff on Wednesdays. I remember this week. Uh, we have a YouTube channel where you can like, subscribe, and comment on Kevin's totally awesome videos weekly. And you can always email us at Raiders of the Podcast at gmail.com. Awesome. Uh, you know what? I'm sorry. They were both good. So you should go watch both movies this week. Uh, Green for Danger, you can find on the Criterion channel. And in the heat of the night is on Prime and a bunch of other places. So is Green for Danger. You can probably find that on maybe Archive or maybe YouTube if you look and don't want to pay anybody anything. But, you know, I wouldn't say that for a fact. I do know. Dead. If... You don't have to pay them. Yay. Yeah, I think in the heat of the night's there too. It's also on Tubi. Uh, until next week, thanks for listening. Thanks for joining me, guys. Yay. See you next together it all just like the worm in the cornfield said to his brother yeah go in one ear and out the other bye, bye.